Hello, saints, peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everybody's doing fantastic out there today. Our last study on Galatians chapter 3, we looked at five separate topics that Paul wrote about. First, we looked at justification by faith, how the law brought a curse, the changeless promise, the purpose of the law, and sons and heirs in Christ Jesus. Also, in that study, we went over numerous reasons why not to use the new versions of the Bible. And if you happen to look at the link that I provided for you, that I shared with you, you should have seen how the King James Bible comes from the Syrian Antioch text, and the newer versions come from the Alexandrian text. Two very different sources. And we also talked about the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And how it's the faith of Christ Jesus that keeps us sealed. Paul wrote about this sealing of the Holy Spirit and the faith of Jesus Christ in many of his letters that he wrote. Paul talks about how we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Look at Ephesians 1 verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that ye believed after ye believed ye were sealed with that holy spirit of promise which is the earnest our promise of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory now moving on paul writes to the galatians because they're being bewitched bewitched back under the yoke of bondage luke records paul's first visit to the galatians the galatian region in acts chapter 13 if you remember our study on the book of acts right around acts 13 in verse 13 now when paul and his company loosed from Paphos they came to Perga in Pamphylia and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem but when they departed from Perga they came to Antioch this isn't this is the little Antioch the second Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down now, Paul reminds the Jews in verse 17 through 26 of Acts 13, Israel's history spanning over 450 years. Then Paul confirms the fulfilling of the scriptures in Acts 13, 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Paul continues declaring the gospel that Jesus was killed, buried, and rose again back to life, fulfilling the scriptures. In Acts 13, 39, Paul declares that belief alone is what justifies, something the laws could not do. In verse 40, Paul warns them about the blindness that comes to those who reject the gospel of grace who continue in the mosaic system of laws and works to be justified. Instead of just believing on Jesus Christ, we see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And we see Gentiles here in Paul's audience as well. In verse 42, Acts 13, 42, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, guess who was there? The Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Well, Paul obliges them. He comes back to preach. He preaches the gospel the next Sabbath. But something very interesting happens. The Gentile crowd that shows up is enormous. And because there's so many Gentiles present to hear Paul speak, this made the Jews very jealous to the point of being very angry. Paul declared that God had now turned from the Jews to the Gentiles. And this, of course, didn't go too well for Paul, to the point 
even mobs of Jews planned to kill Paul. Moving into Acts 14, again Luke records Paul's visit to Galatia. We see Paul preaching once again to the Gentiles, making the Jews, of course, very angry. Quickly, in Acts 14, verse 1, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. And so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, the Gentiles, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. The Jews get so angry at Paul that they stone him to the point that they thought he was dead. But we know of course that Paul didn't die. Paul continues on in his ministry proclaiming the gospel of grace. So Luke records an accurate picture for us concerning this conflict between the law-minded Jews and the body of Christ in the region of Galatia. And the law-minded Jews were doing anything and everything to convince Jews and Gentiles alike that belief alone in Christ Jesus and what he did was, was just not enough. That they had to continue keeping the laws and performing works in order to be justified by God. And apparently it was working. Those who had once believed on Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection alone for salvation, were being convinced back under the law. They were being bewitched. Paul feels that everything he did in Galatia was done in vain. Now, moving on to our study in Galatians chapter 4, Paul is going to address three points or three distinct topics concerning the Galatians. First, Paul's going to address it. He's going to clarify what he means by us being the sons and heirs of God. Second, Paul will express his concern and fears for the body of Christ in Galatia. And third, Paul will explain the difference between the two covenants, specifically the covenant made with Abraham concerning his two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Now, over 30 years later, Paul would write a letter to Timothy concerning his experiences in his early ministry here in Galatia. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. All these persecutions were in the region of Galatia. The year, of course, Galatians chapter 4 is 48 AD. We left off in Galatians chapter 3. Picking up the context of what Paul was writing about. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 3 verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Paul's letter continues in Galatians chapter 4 verse 1 now I say that the heir as long as he is a child differeth nothing from a servant though he be Lord of all but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father Paul speaking about how Israel was kept under the law until the Messiah would come to free them from the bondage of the law in verse 3, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. 
Paul uses the distinction between a servant and a son to explain works versus grace. Under the law, they were as servants, needing continuously to perform and work to prove their worthiness. Under grace, there's no longer a need to prove anything. There's no works. Grace is a free gift. Paul is using legal analogies to explain to the law-minded Jews the difference between law versus grace. In verse 8, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. The Jews knew that there was something greater than themselves. It was in their human nature to know there's something greater and they worshipped gods. The problem was they were worshipping false gods, idols, and not the one true and only living God. In fact, the problem with worshipping idols was one of Israel's downfalls right from the beginning. Strike one for Israel was that they rejected the Father by worshipping idols. Spiritual adultery, terming Israel the harlot. Strike two was when they rejected their Messiah Jesus by having him killed by crucifixion. Strike three came when they rejected the Holy Spirit by killing their prophet Stephen by stoning him to death. All three strikes against Israel is why their promised earthly kingdom was halted. It was postponed. And this secret hid from man since before the foundation of the world was revealed to the Apostle Paul. That's what we know today as the body of Christ. It's a mystery. So that means God's not finished with Israel. His promises are always fulfilled and they will finally get their earthly kingdom, the kingdom of heaven on earth. It will happen. In Joel 2, we read that when they call on the name of the Lord, they will be delivered. This will happen after Daniel's 70th week. They need to be tried through fire, through tribulations. Continuing on, Galatians 4, 9. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days, and months, and times, and years. You see, they were, as the body of Christ, remember, going back, backwards from grace, from freedom of the law, from freedom under bondage, back to bondage, back to idols, back to works, and so on. Observing days, and months, times, and years is, in a, is in a reference to the Gentile believers and even the Jewish believers following Jewish traditions of the Mosaic system. And we still see this happening even today. Verse 11, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am. Paul is saying, be as I am. For I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation was which was in my flesh ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that, if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Paul mentions some type of sickness or physical disability that he had at that time which may have caused a dependency on others. Some ideas tossed around concerning Paul's thorn in the flesh involved Paul's eyesight being horribly bad. Remember, they didn't have glasses or contacts back then. And if Paul had a bad case of myopia or nearsightedness, he would have needed someone to assist him with a lot of things, especially writing, which could have been seen as a weakness or a nuisance to the Galatians. Verse 16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you, that ye might affect them. 
zealously affect you with being zealous for the law as James said in the book of Acts we look back at Acts 21 20 and when they heard it they glorified the Lord and said unto him thou seest brother how many thousands of Jews there are which believe and they are all zealous of the law members of the body of Christ were free from the bondage of the Jews that that they were under and the Jews didn't like that too much Galatians 4 18 but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing and not only when I am present with you being zealous for Christ Jesus is most definitely a good thing as Paul wrote and Paul saw their zealousness when he was with them but after he left they were being bewitched manipulated into another type of zealousness which included the mosaic system of laws and bondage Jewish traditions and customs worshiping months days times years and so on verse 19 my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you Paul felt like everything he did in Galatia was in vain at this point and he needed to start over again he terms it giving them birthing them all over again bringing them back to remembrance of his testimony the scriptures Jesus dying being buried and resurrected freeing them from the laws and God's wrath and so on verse 20 I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you surely Paul wanted to get there as fast as possible before any further damage could be done to the Saints in Christ Jesus I'm in I'm pretty sure if Paul had access to commercial airlines back in his day he would have gotten on a plane flown immediately to the region of Galatia to handle all the chaos that was taking place once Paul left Galatia the law-minded wolves attacked the body of Christ there was a conflict a war between the law and grace between being in bondage and being under liberty okay and it hasn't stopped it's we still see it today today we see many law-minded good works minded lost in the kingdom program minded still trying to put people back under the yoke of bondage Galatians 4 21 tell me ye that desire to be under the law do ye not hear the law for it is written that Abraham had two sons the one by a bondmaid the other by a free woman but he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh but he of the free woman was by promise which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants the one from the Mount Sinai which generateth to bondage which is Hagar for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia in answereth to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children but Jerusalem which is above is free which is the mother of us all if you recall from our study on Galatians chapter 1 Paul mentioned being removed from his mother's womb Galatians 1 15 but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace so we see here in verse 26 his mother's womb is in reference to Jerusalem the mother of Israel the wife of God the bride who will reconcile with God at the second coming verse 27 for it is written rejoice thou barren that bearest not break forth and cry thou that travailest not for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband again speaking of Jerusalem here Israel the Jewish nation those who rejected and cheated on their God killed the son and blasphemed and rejected the Holy Spirit verse 28 now we brethren as Isaac was are the children of promise remember how Abraham was beyond his years he was old he was very old but God promised Abraham that he would be able to perform and Sarah also being very old would conceive and have a son whose name would be Isaac and Ishmael of course was Abraham's son also 
but it was a son through Hagar. Galatians 4.29, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. The seed line of Ishmael, Isaac, didn't get along from day one and still don't today. Verse 30, Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. God's promise to Abraham was that the covenant would be fulfilled through his son Isaac. And we know Isaac had a son named Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. The twelve sons came from Jacob, hence the twelve tribes of Israel. And the last verse, 31, So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. When we continue on in the next chapter, we're going to see uh, part of the legalism being forced upon the body of Christ was circumcision. And this helps us develop a timeline of Paul's ministry because we know that circumcision was one of the subjects discussed at the Jerusalem Council, which took place right around 49 AD. Now, in closing, Israel's covenant was postponed when they rejected Jesus, then the Holy Spirit, and it has been postponed for over 2,000 years now, which we know will be fulfilled right after the rapture when Daniel's week begins. And the covenant will run into the 1,000 years where Israel will be kings and priests ruling and reigning on the earth, the earthly kingdom, also called the kingdom of heaven on earth. This is the kingdom of heaven that Jesus spoke about in the four gospels. This kingdom will be ushered in when, Joel 2, verse 28 to 32, they call on the name of the Lord to be delivered. The book of Galatians, as we've seen so far, is about a battle between law versus grace, bondage versus freedom, works versus a gift. So that's it for this study. Peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Lord willing, I'll see you saints on the next study in Galatians chapter 5.